Good morning. It's Meg Riley in snowy Minneapolis, welcoming you to another episode of The View. We're excited this morning that we'll be talking to our folks from DRUM, but first let's have our regular folks introduce themselves. Aisha. Good morning. I'm Aisha Hauser and I'm in Seattle, Washington, and it is not snowing and it's probably, I don't even know, in the 40s. Jessica always knows the weather better than me, <laughs> but we're doing well. Jessica, how are you? I was wrong about the weather last time. You said it was 40 and I, I said no, but you were right. Um, I'm doing well. It is uh, the same exact weather here as it is where you are. Um, I am on Facebook. I'm monitoring the chat. I am on the view. I am on um, Twitter, hashtag the view, and I overslept today and you can tell, but thankfully I have my coffee with me. Um, Michael, how you doing? I'm doing great this morning. Michael Tino joining you from sunny, beautiful Peekskill, New York, uh, where I have no idea what the temperature is outside, but it's in the battle between fall and winter here in, in the Hudson Valley of New York. And it's good to be with you all. Christina, how are you? I'm well. I'm here joining you in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I woke up this morning to a balmy 18 degrees. Um, and yeah, it's full on winter. I just need to deal with it. Um, and surrender. If I just, if I disappear momentarily, it's because my dog is acting out these days. <laughs> Behind each of us, there is an obnoxious pet, I believe. <laughs> anyway, so I'm really excited. Uh, this morning we have Reverend Ranma Hamani, Hamami from the president of Drum from the Bay Area. You're in Concord or Walnut Creek or one of those places, right? I kind of don't know. Concord. Yeah. <laughs> Concord, okay. And Sana Saeed, the co-vice president of DRUM. And Sana, where are you? I am calling from Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Well, we've kind of got all the time zones here today. Well, welcome. And let's just start with DRUM. Let's just hear what it is. What? How did it get started? When did it get started? Why did it get started? Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm grateful to be here and I'm caffeinating with my turkey mug because I love the turkeys out here in Contra Costa County. They are my favorite. Um, so DRUM, it stands for, let's go with that because you use, we love our acronyms, uh, it stands for Diverse Revolutionary Unitarian Universalist Multicultural Ministries. And uh, it is an organization for Unitarian Universalist people of color. Uh, it's an anti-racism collective that brings together uh, lay members of color and religious professionals of color to overcome racism within Unitarian Universalism and to transform Unitarian Universalism collectively uh, into a more multicultural and liberated Unitarian Universalism. And um, we actually, are in our 21st year uh, of existing. We uh, began in 1997 after the Unitarian Universalist Association adopted the Journey Towards Wholeness Resolution. And we grew out of that when about 30 or so ministers of color from, uh, that included members of what was then LUNA, the Latin, Latinx uh, Unitarian Universalist um, network, I think. Uh, and um, AUM, the African American Unitarian Universalist Ministers Group, uh, they actually met in California that fall and created DRUM uh, to be an organization that started out for religious professionals of color. Uh, and over time, uh, we have evolved to include uh, seminarians and then to include lay members uh, as a, thank you, Michael, networking association because we love our acronyms that much. Um, and uh, yeah, we've evolved to include uh, folks, any, all, any and all Unitarian Universalists of color. Um, and our initial beginnings, we actually had been partly funded by the UUA as part of the Journey Towards Wholeness. Uh, we, there was an office called Faith in Action. Um, Meg, you're smiling, you know, 
<laughs> yeah. Um, and I was uh, there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there was actually about $40,000 initially that had been funded for drum annually and it included staff support um, and support for our operations. And over time, that funding and that support has dwindled to nothing, unfortunately, and the Faith in Action Office is no longer in existence. Um, but DRUM has persevered and continues to exist and continues to uh, find ways to develop programming for Unitarian Versalists of Color and create networks and support. Yeah. Do you meet regularly or is it more long distance networking or how does that work? So we have a, a few times when uh, the drum larger community meets. So the drum steering committee meets twice a month right now, bless them by Zoom. Thank you, technology. <laughs> um, and then we have uh, two major national, loca national gatherings that we have with our, um, our larger community or, or opportunities for people to connect. Uh, one is our annual fall gathering, which we um, just actually had last month in San Antonio. And um, the other time is at General Assembly, where we have our annual meeting and we typically have a drum track, um, with GA being a bit of a question mark for a lot of us uh, this coming GA. Uh, we're still planning to be there. We just don't know what, the, um, what exactly our programming will be, though we have some ideas. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, uh, there are lots of small pockets of Unitarian Universalists of color that are meeting. Um, you know, we have places in San Diego, there are places in the Northeast, um, uh, San Antonio, there's uh, some folks there also meeting. And so there are pockets of Unitarian Universalists of color that are meeting sort of under the drum umbrella informally. Um, but they, and they are often connected to either a drum member that has been a part of our network for a while or a current steering committee member somehow. Yeah. And is there any international component or is this all associated with UUA kind of? Um, so the international component is something that we have struggled with, but something that we continue to um, want to build. Um, we are, I, Sana, you might be able to speak more to this because you have been working with the um, sort of, you've had more international UU connections. Um, and I know a couple of our members have been part of the International Council. Um, so Sana, I don't know if you wanna answer more about that. Um, I think we've gotten um, requests from folks who are interested in building um, drum chapters in the different countries that they are in. Um, I went to the ICUU gathering in Nepal in February and um, some of what came out was a, a desire to meet with folks of color um, and learn more about the ways we're doing programming here for folks to support them in ministry. Um, so I do see and hear that. I think we don't have um, the infrastructure to do that yet but I think it's a vision that we have as drum leaders. And how about youth and young adults of color? Is there a, is there a component piece of that? Or are you working with other groups or just trying to get kind of the, the lay of the land here? Yeah, so we actually have a, a history of having what um, some of our current major players in Unitarian Universalism have come out of Drum Yaya, which is Drum Youth and Young Adults. And um, for example, Greg Boyd, who serves on the UUA board is uh, one of the folks that came out of that programming. Um, uh, Elandria Williams is another person. Um, Joseph Santos Lyons, Marisol Caballero. Those are all folks that have come out of that. Um, with, and some of the work that is happening with youth and young adults of color and multicultural families um, have, some, have some roots in some of the organizing that the early, uh, drum history uh, in our in the early drum operations. So there were multicultural families retreats. Um, I think uh, somewhere in the late 90s, there were also um, youth and young adult of color gatherings being hosted by um, Danielle Glad, um, Kristen Harper. Um, and so those, uh, there had been a really strong uh, uh, gathering and strong support for that early on when drum had the operation operations and um, finances to do that. Um, 
in the last few years, we haven't had as much of an opportunity to do a focused um, drum yaya uh, activity or any sort of real focused operations. Um, that's not to say youth and young adults aren't a part of drum. The actually a large majority, I think the majority of our current steering committee qualify as young adults under the UU umbrella. Um, and uh, we actually have been in touch, uh, we were in touch recently with um, some UU youth of color that are part of the, leading the youth caucus. And um, they've actually requested uh, partnership with DRUM for general assembly programming. And we are committed to making sure that that happens um, at GA and really building up uh, DRUM Yaya again. We have some great outreach folks that are really um, pumped about that. Yeah. So you've alluded a couple of times to the relationship with the UUA and the withdrawal may be too strong of a word, but the um, dwindling and neglect, well, we can at least say, um, uh, and the short attention span that the UUA seems to have for many programs involving marginalized people. Um, what are, your, what are your thoughts about going forward? I know that the UUA leadership is talking a lot about culture change, and I'm curious where you see DRUM fitting into that and, and how you feel like it's going in terms of getting some support. Yeah, um, I think the, the short attention span, or I sometimes call it the sort of like one and done approach that Unitarian Universalists um, can uh, fall prey to is something that we, I feel like uh, have been impacted by. Um, and the sense that anti-racism work, um, building multicultural community um, is something that just gets done once and you don't have to keep doing it. And so um, the way that that support has dwindled and the way that some of the even institutional roles at the UUA um, have been sort of, it reflects that and that in turn reflects what we're able to do as an organization that is not officially, uh, not a part of the UUA, even though we are Unitarian Universalists. Um, but all of that being said is um, in the fall of 2016, um, we actually issued a call for renewal. It was on the 20th year um, following the journey towards wholeness resolution. Um, and we, um, in that call for renewal, we um, asked the Unitarian Universalist Association and Unitarian Universalists to um, sort of recommit to their anti-racism, anti-oppression and multicultural uh, ministry work. Um, because we felt that there had been a backsliding. Um, and uh, since then, we've also started to put a little bit more pressure on the Unitarian Universalist Association to um, connect with DRUM. And uh, we feel that that relationship was not necessarily, um, it, we weren't in right relationship anymore, is how I will describe it. We felt that. Um, the Unitarian Universal Association with the backsliding and with the dwindling of support kind of uh, reflected, um, it, it, ref it reflected a break in our relationship in a way that DRUM didn't want. Um, and so when we, we've actually been in conversations and I think, after, I think tomorrow morning have another conversation with some UUA staff about um, sort of what it looks like moving forward. Um, yeah. And I think what makes it tricky, if I may jump in, is um, the, the change in UUA leadership every however many years, and now it's going to be different. Wouldn't it be great if we had more of a mechanism of institutional memory, and it's not just based on the whim of whoever is elected, and then if someone, whether or not they're a person of color, doesn't really see as a priority um, this work, I'm trying to be intentional here because the person previous, Susan Frederick Gray, really, maybe it was felt like it was done. Um, and so there was just intentional neglect. I think neglect is the right word. Um, and so I, my experience of this administration is there's, there is a desire for intentional 
a, a, an, an intentional moving forward that includes um, um, making an effort to make priority this work. I don't know if my, if my words are making sense. So I think that the invitation and or challenge is doing that in a way that doesn't change five years from now, I think. I mean, I, I think some of this for me, I see it as an investment um, because I, I think Susan's doing great. I mean, her, her the Commission on Institutional Change and Susan and Carrie and now Jessica York is, I mean, I think this is stuff that can be genuinely transformative and you know, how do we do this so that uh, it doesn't disappear with the next president? Well, and I think, you know, it should be noted that that if we're trying to transform an institution steeped in white supremacy culture uh, to be um, anti-racist and multicultural, uh, that white supremacy culture pushes back on that, whoever, whoever it is that's in charge, right? So you know, you can call it neglect or withdrawal or whatever. It, it was, in my experience, outright hostility um, to, to, drum, to drum leadership and to drum youth and young adults and to, and to the staff people like Joseph um, who wanted to, to give more institutional support to drum over the years. I mean, it was, it was not some sort of benign uh, withdrawal. It, it was, it was an active uh, process of, of shutting drum out because drum, you know, the, the leadership that drum was developing and continues to develop it was pushing the institution. Uh, in ways that the people here on the view might go, oh yes, our institution needs to be pushed in that way. Um, but you know, white supremacy culture uh, doesn't like it. <laughs> so I, I just want to I want to name that. And you know, Redwa, you you can use whatever words are are you know the, the ones that that you would use to. Do, I don't want to speak for you or for Drum. Um, but just in my experience, I was on UUA staff uh, directing the Young Adult and Campus Ministry Office when all this started happening. Um, and my experience was not good. I had to fight every year to fund Drum Yaya. Um, so I'll just speak from my own experience. Well, Michael, I think you, I think you point to a really good, you know, cyclical um, happening in that we see we see it working. So drum yaya was working, drum was working. Um, you saw, you know, that it produced many, as Ronald said, many of the leaders that we have today in Unitarian Universalism, um, Jubilee training, you know, all of those things were working and it was making people very uncomfortable, right? So, and let me clarify, it was making white people very uncomfortable. And, um, and we're not quiet in that discomfort. And we're not quiet in wanting to see Unitarian Universalism uh, return to um, something that they knew from before and was comfortable with. And, you know, um, and, and so you saw that, that, you know, backlash uh, of white supremacy trying to re-exert its, its dominance and supremacy within Unitarian Universalism. So, um, you know, as we go into hopefully a new period of renewed commitment to this work, um, that is something that we need to not just know will happen, but prepare for happening because that's gonna happen. Like that, that backlash, you know, it's already, it started after last spring already. Um, and it's not just enough to say that we know it's going to happen, but what are we going to do when it happens? Um, and and I think that's the part that I so respect um, that Drum has said is, you know, we're here to do it, and we're here to hold the EUA accountable for doing it, and um, in 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 ways that you know, God bless y'all, um, you know. Other people may have just walked away from the table, 
um, because to stay at this table has taken um, everything from a lot of people and, and some were not able to stay. Um, and that's, you know, I, I always liken it to a congregation where people are, you know, very concerned about con people leaving congregations when congregations start to do uh, racial justice work. And I ask them, you know, well, where is your concern for the people of color who have come through your congregation and churned um, through that congregation? Have you run after them in the same way that you're now running after um, the folks that are leaving? So we yeah. have, oh, I was just gonna flag that there's a whole conversation going on on Facebook and that there are a couple uh, member, uh, current member of the steering committee seems to be on there. Um, wait a second, Kim yeah. Wardner yeah. says yeah. yes. Yeah. And Joseph Santos Lyons from the Philippines, former president talking about having worked with Michael and the hostility. And, and I just wanted to flag this, um, the, um, the pet threat dynamic, loving people of color when they're compliant until they're not, and then seeing them as a liability. And, and to me, that partly goes with um, people on staff at the UUA and, out, and outside groups. And it feels like there need to be both of those roles. But, and, but I see real people I love getting crushed in the middle of those dynamics often. And I, I would love it if we could really figure out a way to make those dynamics work for us. Because I remember being on staff and a lot of the pressure does come from donors and from stakeholders. And, and so there's gonna be that pressure. I'm not there anymore and it's much easier not being there, right? And so right. How, to, how to keep the support strong, um, because I was shocked sometimes at the silence of the good people when the shit storms were happening at the UUA. And there was there was not a demand. There was there was not a there would be a demand in one direction that would not be met by a demand in another direction that was um, made it hard to be there sometimes. So and especially I'm curious, people are flagging how important it is for white allies to 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 get other white people out of the way and to help make this happen. So anyway, huge discussion there, but I'm, I'm really curious how, because drama is a lot of, it is still is a lot of religious professionals. And so it still is a, an interesting, I think, um, dynamic that drum is in regarding the UUA. And so anyway, I'm curious about any of that, which is of interest to pursue for anybody. Um, thanks, for, thanks Aisha and Ranwa. Um, for lifting up to step in. Um, yeah, I think this is such an important conversation. I think in our experience, um, or particularly my experience as um, drum co-vice president, um, I feel like that silence is still around sometimes when it comes to acting, um, taking a step towards supporting drum within the UUA um, staff, but also the larger denomination and um, and that takes a lot of emotional labor. I feel like I've seen the toll in the last year and a half of that emotional labor and what it's done to the steering committee folks um, and the lack of mental health resources we have for supporting folks through the institution is another thing that we're failing <laughs> in um, just as a denomination and association supporting our leaders and um, and the young adult leaders, especially, um, it's, it's a traumatic experience, the way that we have to use our own physical and emotional selves to be recognized and seen as legitimate leadership that belongs at the center of Unitarian Universalism. Um, I really wanted to lift that up. I also wanted to lift up that the people that have been supporting us um, have been folks like our ARE. Um, and some of the questions that we've been thinking about is, you know, where does the accountability lie when it comes to who is accountable to um, being allies, but also who's the UUA accountable to? And that's the one thing I've been really thinking about in the last few months. Who is the UUA accountable to if it doesn't have groups like Drum and Blue Around 
to hold them accountable for things that they're not doing. Um, because I'm, I'm, I'm in a place where I'm consistent. I'm trying to like manage this, this feeling of surprise um, at the defensiveness that I feel from colleagues <laughs> when it comes to holding them accountable. But then at the same time, not being surprised because this is what, you know, white supremacy culture is. And so I feel like I'm walking this middle line as a leader in drum, um, trying to navigate how do I hold people accountable? How do I hold myself accountable and my colleagues accountable? And how do we do it in a compassionate way without burning ourselves out? Yeah, those are a few thoughts. Yeah, and I, I mean, I'll add to that where the what Sana is describing about sort of the, the effect that um, I know I'll speak personally that it has been exhausting and um, emotionally um, and spiritual demanding to be in um, in drum leadership. And as much as I love our community, as much as I, I love the leaders I'm working with, um, it it's really hard um, and it is a scary situation to be you know in conversation with the uua president or in a, in the in a room with a dozen board leaders and basically begging for money and that's not a situation that we should ever have to have been in um particularly when our association is um you know uh, claiming to want to center the margins and wanting to really address um, white supremacy within our faith and within our world. And I, I don't want to ignore the fact that we have um, Aisha and Christina here who really um, uh, started up this current cycle of our faith, remembering that, oh, right, yeah, we still have this as a problem in our communities. Um, and also the fact that, like Sana was saying, this. Um, the toll that it takes on UUs of color and particularly um, leaders in drum has been since its inception. Um, there are folks that have been pushed out. Um, I think Joseph had mentioned in his comments, Robert Diaz, who um, was one of like one of the OGs of drum and is no, came I think to the first drum gathering in years um, at this past general assembly. And so, uh, just the reality that there are people who aren't in Unitarian Universalism even anymore because of their experiences, whether it's having been uh, pushed back on by institutions because they've been asking for the support that our faith claims to offer or um, they've died, honestly. We've had people who this toll is physical and it takes a toll on their health um, and that's a reality. Yeah, and I wanted just to quickly jump in to follow up on what Ranwa just said. Um, one of the tolls it took was, you know, we lost quite a few folks in terms of elders, right, in our movement. And so one thing that we've been trying to do in the past year and a half is to form um, groups, a group of elders, and elders meaning like um, folks who have been presidents in the past, folks who are have been steering committee members, reconnecting with the leadership um, that has served us in the past and, and trying to convene them because they hold such rich knowledge about what has happened with DRUM and, and their vision is still relevant to today. Um, and so that's really exciting work, but it's also very tragic in the same way. <laughs> realizing how they were just pushed out of um, Unitarian Universalism in some ways. That is so true, uh, Sana. Uh, in, the, in the past years that I've been on the board, um, you know, we have the Distinguished Service Award that's given every year. And I have been a vocal um, critic of that award in the way it's currently structured because in some years, the, it wasn't just the overwhelming, it was all white nominees. And the, the pushback that I always got was, well, you know, we, we just don't have um, POC, um, you know, people to nominate. And I'm like, why the hell do you think that is? Like, you know, first of all, it's not true. 
Um, so I'll just put that out there. But you know, why? You know, let's examine that. Let's let's give you know an award to to that fact that that so many people are no longer here. Um, and I think that you know, as we're going through and examining all of those different ways that that we lift up and affirm that white supremacy culture, you know, we have to have a find a way to lament that um, in a real and profound way, um, because that, you know, even as somebody who's come into drum, you know, in the past ten years, like I have, even not knowing that when I came into drum, I felt that. And I felt that loss. And as we have youth and young adults who come through drum, they come in and even if they don't know it, they feel it. Um, and, and, and that means that Unitarian Universalism feels that loss as well. I also don't want, to, okay. Um, because it was Joseph who wrote, who made it, who, who uh, Joseph Santos Lyons. Hi, Joseph, who's in the Philippines, which is fun uh, watching. Um, he named that, that there was pushback from white ministers. And I don't want to lose that because right now it is still true that who has the institutional power are white ministers, ordained clergy and white ordained clergy. Now, this is not about hashtag not all white ministers. I get it. And there, we need to name, because right now there's still ministers who still, who say, I will not use the words white supremacy, fine. But that also, it translates into, I'm, I'm gonna center white fragility and not do the anti-racism work in the way it needs to be done. We need to meet people where they're at. I think that's a great idea, but staying there or taking them back into the tent is not moving forward what needs to happen, or at least take people like five steps forward, something. But, but this is not a small thing that we have so many ministers that are hostile still today, hostile to the white supremacy teaching, to the words, to anti-racism work, use whatever words you want and want to basically be white ministers to a country club. Now, I, in fairness, we have some ministers of color who are deans who are also holding up some of this and aren't happy with any of this, but, it, but they're in the minority, thankfully. But um, so, so that's important to name because white supremacy culture is alluring to people who are benefiting from this system. And right now it is white ministers. And I don't, I don't want, cause that was written a couple of times and I don't want to lose that point. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> yes, uh, yes. That's all I can say to that. Absolutely. Um, having watched having been really in the center of the crossroads model or that you know which every all those white ministers then said i'm really against racism but i just don't like this model it's not the right model so then to hear 20 years later i i'm real I'm, I'm still there i just i don't like this language it's like well what have you been doing for the last 20 years to find language you like then i'm really curious because you say that you want to do this work what you're just waiting for someone to deliver to you a palatable step-by-step -step, non-painful way to address white supremacy it's never going to happen it's it is never going to happen there is too much pain if you the minute you get real in it there is just too much pain and so for people who just can't bear to step into that pain, they're always gonna identify that the pain comes from the model, when in fact, the pain comes from the history, the pain comes from the testimonies, the pain comes from the relationships. And um, yeah, yes, Aisha. And I'm sure they're religious educators too, she says defensively, <laughs> but really oh, yeah. the ministers hold the power, you're right. And a lot of stopping power a lot of let's just not do this power. We'll do it next year. Or we'll, we'll, we'll try to do it in a way that we won't get vandalized or whatever it is, whatever, however it comes in the door. Yeah. Yeah. And something that when you said the word palatable, I instantly cringed because I am like, this work shouldn't be palatable. This is painful work. You know, I am, I'm relatively new to Unitarian Universalism and, um, I 
I have felt the pain and the grief of decades of hardship that um, weren't technically mine, but are a part of my communities and are a part of the folks that I see as elders and mentors. And that pain shouldn't be softened. I think we are often so quick to want to censor what is happening. We're so quick to, um, I, I mean, I, I remember some of the initial responses to um, the, the white supremacy culture and white supremacy teach-ins um, that were coming from the highest levels of the UUA quickly um, diminishing what was being shared. And I, I, we can't do that. That's not, that's not what Unitarian Universalism should be. And I don't like to use the word should often, but we, we should be grieving this. We, we should be actually feeling the pain and the trauma that is in our history and actually starting to um, understand it. Yeah. Oh, Ooh, Mel Hoover's on. So <laughs> Hello, speaking Mel. of elders, hi, Mel, <laughs> a mentor for so many of us. So Mel, posing as his wife, Rose Eddington, <laughs> asked this question. Next year, the UUA is supposed to be presented with and to adopt a new structure. From Drum's perspective, this is so Mel, and I love it so much. Yay, Mel. What are the three to four critical aspects that must be there to achieve future Drum hopes for our faith? especially since change agency is now centered in congregations where there are fewer people of color and anti-racist activists. I'm asking how we develop a critical mass for institutional change. Well, Mel, I wish you were here because I bet you have 10 ideas about that. <laughs> but meanwhile, who else has thoughts on that? I think um, as Renoir and Sana collect their thoughts on that very meaty question, I just want to make sure that our viewers understand that Mel Hoover ran the faith in action department that that Renoir noted before and was instrumental in that that funding that came to drum so many years ago and so uh, as a as an elder of color in our in our movement I want to just lift up everyone here out there might not know who Mel Hoover is so we're, and he's we're a minister. Mel. yes and he personally dealt with more crap than any human being should ever have to deal with from any faith, but in his case, Unitarian Universalist. And DRUM has um, the Mel Hoover Award, which is given annually. And of course, um, Mel was the first one to receive it. Um, and uh, we were deeply, deeply grateful for, for him. And yeah, all the, all the love and feels, Mel. Yeah, thank you, Mel, for that that meaty question. Sana and I are rapidly going back and forth. <laughs> so, um, but you know, one of the things that um, I immediately think uh, think about is changing the the budget to actually center center those of us that have been on the margins. The the budget priorities are are not centering the people who keep coming back and saying, we are still encountering this. You haven't lived up to this mission and this promise. Um, so I think really looking at, at, at budget priorities and it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to be messy. Um, and that's, that's what transformation is. That's what, that's what it means to actually live into our promise. Um, and I, I think with that is to, you know, one of the questions that came up in conversations among uh, a few of us that were at the most recent board meeting in October um, was we need to stop ignoring the question that is the elephant in the room, which is what happens when the white people leave? Um, and so I think that is starting to envision, well, what happens when that happens? What do we do? And start to think about what Unitarian Universalism is then. Um, yeah, and I, Sana, I know you've got some thoughts on this too. Yeah, exactly what you said, Ranwa, and I think financial stability for DRUM is so critical right now, going into um, the type of risks we're taking. And I really wanna lift up, you know, this idea that um, all this change is happening at the UUA and we're experimenting with all these different types of leadership models and things like that how is that going to trickle down to the congregations <laughs> you know like what are we envisioning that will actually happen at a congregational level when we have a polity that is 
you know, <laughs> let leaves congregations autonomous to decide for themselves how they want to transform and change. And that's a really big challenge for us. Um, and I don't know if we're really thinking about that as critically because change at GA looks great, but then you go back to your home congregation and the same stuff is happening there. Um, so that's, so I, I resonate with Mel's question and, and um, concern there. Um, one thing that comes up for me is how do we support the POC lay leaders and POC ministers and seminarians who are taking the risk to step into this prophetic ministry because that's what it is. It's prophetic going in and pushing folks and challenging folks to change the way we see and center white uh, people of color. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> um, and I really think about this because, you know, the commission and, um, came out with the blog about um, not having enough support for religious professionals of color and seminarians of color. And, um, and I know, you know, personally, in my own experience, I question what, you know, how will this impact my MSc interview whenever I step into the room with the UA Board of Trustees or any type of leadership and I'm pushing to have drum acknowledged and pushing for funding for drum because it's happened to people, people have not passed and people have been pushed out. So I really think one of the critical things that we need to have in place is support for POCs who take the risk to speak up and also we need to be challenging more white folks to take that risk. Yeah, uh, and I, I think, you know, um, it has been helpful to have white allies and accomplices in recent months to that have been willing to back us up, ARE has really um, upped their game <laughs> in the last couple of months um, and has been able to say things where we have honestly felt as though it, we felt that it would be a risk for us to say things. And so they've said, we'll do it. That's our job. We will lift these things up. Um, and I think that it's time for our, our faith leaders, our our ministers, our religious educators, which many of them are doing this work at, at great personal risk um, to, to start saying, we'll say the thing that folks are afraid to say. We'll say the thing that, um, that we know puts you at risk. Um, we need people to start embodying that risk in a, in a, in a big way. And that includes our faith at its highest level um, in its operations. Christina, you're on mic. Is that because you want to say something? I was just saying that I have to run and oh. I love all of you people so much. And I look forward to watching the rest of it um, right after I get back from my meeting. Take care. Okay, great. Thanks. I was going to say I'm doing a little part time gig um, with, a, with a team in a suburban congregation here. And it, it's really good for me to see a typical congregation. This is a very typical congregation that I'm in. And you know, it's great to have the view and talk about all this stuff. And then I get there and it's like the 101 would be a generous description of some of the things people have said, you know, I mean, and of course they feel like they get it, you know, they already, they already know this, they already did this. And um, so it's been deeply humbling, I will say, um, to try to figure out you know, I'm their interim. I don't care if I'm pre-fired. There's nothing they can do to me, you know. Um, so it's not, it's not fear like that, which could hold me back if I had kids in school and, you know, couldn't lose the job and stuff. I mean, so I'm in a really privileged position, but I'm still sometimes speechless and I need to get over it. I need to never be speechless, but, but I feel like in order not to be, I need to practice some things I haven't needed to do for a really long time. And um, so it's, 
I feel like we who are white, we need to get together and practice this stuff so that we, you know, groups like ARE are doing that. There isn't, as I understand it, ARE is going into congregations and working with them and beloved congregations goes into congregations and works with them. And there are local initiatives that we're getting the church I'm with involved in that are multi-faith, but there isn't anything that replaced Jubilee, right? I mean, there isn't a training program that goes into congregations is, is am i correct from, from headquarters well i i'll i'll say that there um there isn't anything that's replaced it beloved conversations is something that's done as far as i know beloved conversations um is something that goes into congregations and does this work for like a 10-week period um, ARE and Drama have actually started to develop something uh, that they piloted in Palomar recently following um, an incident around cultural misappropriation. And um, the hope is to start bringing more of that out and developing it um, in a way that can be applied to various congregations. There may be something that's come out um, that doesn't necessarily replace Jubilee, but it's an evolved form of Jubilee. I don't know if panelists know or not. well jubilee is still around i mean you could still get jubilee or um still have a jubilee training and there are several there there's a lot out there that can be done i wanted to speak to um the congregational polity part of this so i'm at a congregation i've been there now i'm in my sixth year and i've worked for two other congregations on the east coast um from, so this is my third, which I know is not many, but it's three. Um, I've, I've genuinely felt a, for the most part, and yes, there is definitely a country club mentality among many. And there, there's a genuine desire among those who really want to do better. And without guidance or at the very least, so, so I, I've been very um, frustrated and hopeful <laughs> at what's happening with Congregational Life staff, given the new hire, uh, Jessica York is now Director of Congregational Life staff, is one of the things I've said whenever I've been approached from anyone from the Director of uh, Stewardship and Development offices, I say, look, yeah, I will tell people to support the UUA when the support we get directly from the UUA in terms of Congregational Life staff is rooted in anti-oppression work and rooted in understanding how white fragility shows up. So I don't think, the I think polities sometimes I have experienced being used by folks who simply don't want to do the work by, and maybe it's ministers who are afraid, who don't want to lose their jobs. I totally get that. And I think the desire is there more than it's not. And I think if folks, Meg, I mean, I think you're in a, I, I, what, one of the things I, I admire most about you is even when you are speaking, I've, I've witnessed it. I've been in meetings with you where, you know, someone will say something that's, and, and you have a way of um, reflecting, being curious, that that is going to kind of move people, and maybe not right that second, but I think stepping into the work, there's more um, opportunity for that, and that's why I get frustrated at white ministers who simply refuse, who are like, nope, I'm not going to do it. Well, then there's an entire congregation that isn't going to have to do anything or isn't going to do anything. When I see ministers step into it, yes, it is difficult, but it's not impossible, and we do have. Um, we, it, it, I'm going to stop now, but we have an opportunity and, and we have more of an opportunity than I think we realize. So that's why I get frustrated with when I hear a religious educator, and it's true, there are religious educators who aren't comfortable with this, but we're not the ones who have institutional power. I mean, you know, even people who point to what Christina, Kenny, and I started, Kenny's no longer a UU. Christina just, you know, I mean, she, she's had major issues and I'm I'm still at this congregation and we'll see what happens. I mean, so so that needs to be said. It's what it didn't come without cost. Yes, and I sure didn't mean to say, therefore I'm not gonna do anything. I all I was trying to say is, wow, our congregations, there's a reality check. And I think Mel just posted, we've lost understanding of power dynamics since not doing Jubilees. And and I'm curious, because um, we only have about 10 minutes left and I want, we, there's a huge discussion here, but I want to get back to drum a little bit more. And what, do, what are you all wanting to move forward? And, and what is your constituency wishing that 
besides that the finances would come through and more support in that way, which we all need to speak out for when we're asked to support the UUA. That's one thing any of us can respond the way Aisha said that she did. Um, but what else, what else, or, or more on that? What, what's important to y'all? Um, so I can start and then Sana, I would love to um, have you add some more things too, because I know I'll forget it. It's earlier on my coast. Um, uh, but you know, one of the things we're really hoping to do is much more regional and um, local gatherings. We want to make sure that the 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 people, <laughs> not just the not just the leadership, but the actual Unitarian Universalists of color are the ones with the power to create what it is they know Unitarian Universalism can be to create a Unitarian Universalism that right now hasn't been working from this. Um, even though we say we have congregational polity, it's really been a top-down process. Um, and I think we need to start, this is part of where that reckoning is happening, where you know, our, our institutions and our organizations are starting to be called to account about the, the fact that they've held the power where our, um, those that have been the most marginalized have been trying to get the power we've been told we have. Um, and so doing these regional gatherings, we're going to be at the Mid-America Regional Assembly um, in April, and we will be at the Pacific Southwest District Assembly, which I think is also in April. Um, we're hoping to have a gathering in Miami for Florida local folks following Finding Our Way Home um, for a day or two, and um, that'll be in March. Um, and we really, we, we need the, the support to be able to, to give folks that sense of connection to drum and to be able to support them with resources, with, um, with mentorship, with leadership development. We have our Global Majorities Collective that is innovating Unitarian Universalism, Unitarian Universalism in a really multicultural way where Unitarian Universalists of color are creating theologies, are creating resources, are creating art um, that is rooted in their understanding of Unitarian Universalism. And we, that's our vision. That's our hope is to support that kind of work. Um, Sana, please take it away. <laughs> no, I think you touched on a lot of things that we're planning on doing in the next year and a half. Um, we're also, um, planning a multicultural families retreat. And um, that was really inspired in part from uh, Lareda last year, but also like um, from historical um, work that we've already done in drum before in the past. Um, and it's just converged and become something really amazing that is gonna take place this summer. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, Looking forward to General Assembly, still thinking about what it's gonna look like um, on the ground. Um, and I think uh, one of the things that we're really excited about too is um, our virtual and online um, engagement. Um, we are growing our membership and we're hoping that more folks will join us, um, that we can connect more with lay leaders. And so one of the things that we're doing with Finding Our Way Home is what, what we were calling it lay day, right? So <laughs> a lay day. Um, so we're really excited about that because um, we want to be able to support more lay leaders on the ground. And what would, what would serve you well for people who aren't part of DRUM for, who want to support the work besides pushing for funding? Anything else that would be useful? I know ARE is going to come next week and and they're really looking at how to, to be of support specifically. So um, they can talk about that too, but I wondered if there was anything you wanted to say. I mean, I think one of the things that would be really helpful is for folks that are in positions of leadership in congregations or communities, if you know of Unitarian Universalists of color that are really struggling to find community and connection, connect them to us. Um, we wanna make sure that they are supported. We have two chaplains that are available we um, we're, you know, we're hoping to create these gatherings and to create these spaces that um, folks who are maybe on the verge of leaving can find a, a Unitarian Universalism that at, at their baseline, at its baseline really understands what they're experiencing and um, centers them. Yeah. 
So send them to the website. Is that the best way to do that? Send them to the website. Um, they can email us info at drum.org. Um, they um, can connect with us on Facebook. We have a Facebook group called The Gathering Place that um, Tyler Coles and um, Rhiannon Smith, our two communications co-coordinators, uh, have uh, created. Um, yeah, that we want to make sure that we're actually hearing from people and really creating that community. I, I would also add on to that. Um, folks who are interested should maybe take the time to learn about the history of drum, um, educate themselves about drum. Um, we're, you know, we struggle sometimes with being confused for Blue and Blue is its own organization and is doing really amazing work. But this tendency of folks to lump all people of color into the same thing in one giant blob and we're separate entities and, um, I think take the time to go learn the history and learn about the leaders and, and the work that's been happening um, because that's really helpful in keeping the memory, the history alive and not feeling erased. And learning institutional history. Um, that was one of the biggest things that we came across um, at the UUA board meeting was people not understanding why we were coming in such a challenging situation and, and having to tell UUA leadership it was because the UUA defunded us that we're where we are now, um, that we've been struggling um, and really having people reckon with that history. Yeah. So we just have a couple of minutes and Ranwa, this isn't quite related to drum, but you were just down at the border and I wondered if you could describe your trip a little bit. It was both, at, you know, we're all waking up with nightmares about this whole situation at the border, but you also had some joy and beauty there that I think is, is really worth sharing. So can you just take the last couple of minutes and, and share about your trip? Sure. Um, so I went with a, a border trip that was organized by the UU Justice Ministry of California, um, where I'll actually be starting in January. Um, and uh, uh, this is a, a border trip that's in partnership with Gerimar, which is um, a, a community uh, that does these um, accountable and partnered um, uh, dele border delegations and trips and learning experiences. Um, and there were there was a delegation of about six or seven of us that went down um, right as the early waves of the um, asylum seeker um, caravan was coming in. And so our trip was agenda was be flexible. We don't know what's going to happen and we have to follow the lead of our partners about what we can and can't do and where where this delegation can and can't go. And we ended up finding ourselves at a location where the um, LGBTQ contingent was staying um, and went there, asked them, talked to them about what's going on um, and asked what Unitarian Universalists can support um, and what local partners need um, to get a better sense. And in that conversation, we were asked, can you do a wedding today? And, and so Within three hours, this was what I'm calling the queer loaves and fishes story because within three hours, we had a, a service in Spanish, thanks to Tania Marquez. We had um, Spanish, uh, a Spanish uh, marriage certificate that the CLF was um, eager to provide. Um, and uh, we had rings for seven couples, rainbow carnations, an altar, glitter cannons, um, don't ever throw rice at a wedding besides it being bad for the birds. It also hurts, but we had the rice thrown. We had everybody there and it was such a joyous experience to see this community that really was a family um, coming together and celebrating each other, um, having that little moment of, um, of joy and, and resilience. Um, and that same night they had to pack up and move to a new location because it wasn't safe for them to be in that location anymore. And so there's that stark contrast of having this joy and this party and this celebration of love and then that uncertainty of where they're going next. And so it's a, I think that's a, a, 
a really powerful juxtaposition to describe sort of what's happening when it comes to this community and this um, caravan of asylum seekers supporting each other and then also living in a life-threatening uncertainty. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the story and thanks for the ministry. Well, that's another hour. Thanks so much for coming, Sana and Ranwa. Come back anytime, open door, anytime you got something you want to talk about. Mel Hoover, I want to have you on a show. I'm just telling you now. <laughs> and thanks to all the people who talked on Facebook today. Next week, we'll have ARE with us, Alice for Racial Equity. And um, yeah, it's we're going to do this thing, y'all. And what lovely people to get to do it with. Thanks a bunch. <laughs>